uh, turning the floor to the head of delegation to start uh, addressing the questions. Paul, you have the floor, sir. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Before giving the floor to my colleague to respond to the question posed by the, by the floor, I would like to make some comments uh, uh, after listening the question posed by our colleague around the table here. First, I would like to assure you that we are here to listen to you, to listen to your comments, to listen to your advice, and we thank tremendously for the very excellent question, for the very excellent analysis on our uh, performance as a country on this uh, ICCPR. So I appreciate that. <coughs> Professor Karen said that uh, maybe I am uncomfortable by the question. Maybe I cannot respond to the question. Professor Khan, I can assure you, I am here to listen to you. And I'm very pleased that you can pose question very directly and, and very constructively. I appreciate that very much. My feeling, to be frank with all of you here, is that for the first time, we are meeting in this dialogue between Laos and a state party in the committee. And it's not easy to listen to the excellent comments from the excellent members of the committee. In my country, to get the gathering like this, it costs a lot of money and it costs a lot of time. But today, we listen to your comments as you encourage us to perfect our, our state and our country. So I consider your comments, your proposal, and your question as encouragement, as mean in way to improve the management of our country. I appreciate that. In I can assure you, if I can implement all of this, your proposal, your comments, Laos will be an excellent state. Laos will become a state of providence. Laos will become a full rule of law state. If I say it in France, not only a état de droit, but état de droit. If my memory is, uh, my understanding is correct on, on the legal rule of law. So all the professors that give us the comments, I can be very, very clear that I appreciate your comments, your proposal. Don't feel you said uncomfortable by giving us the comments. If I come here and listen to you, you give us very few comments that I will be very disappointed. So your comments will, be, uh, will mean a lot for, for Laos to improve the country. That's my first remark. My second remark, you propose to us so many comments, so many proposals. You want Laos to be a state like you want to be. But in reality, Laos is a small country underdeveloped country, very difficult in terms of economic, in terms of financial, in terms of everything to implement all, all the comments, proposal I made by, by your distinguished member of our committee. But of course, if your proposal will be supported by your presence in the country, it may be by financial support together with the proposal then I can assure you, after two years, Laos will be able to become a full member of ICPR with excellent performance from our country. But your proposal is full of meaning, but without financial support. How a poor country like Laos can implement all of this? So next time, when we met in Vientiane, one year and a half from now, you will see by your own eyes what it, Laos is. It's not like, like, like I hear here, Laos should do that, Laos should do that. If we can do that, we have done already in the past. But because we can know that, because none that we don't have the willingness to do that, we have the willingness to do that. 
but we cannot do it because there are so many criteria, so many conditions that preventing us from, the, from doing such performance. So we attempt once again the almost 30 questions posed to us this afternoon, but not enough. Tomorrow I need more questions, more proposal, more advice from you so we can, I say in France, uh, perfection, not, not to be, not data, to become, to become a fully the rule of law state into fully a country with respect of human rights. I think every country, every leader need a country with full um, human rights enjoyment by its own people. No leaders doesn't want to have their own people suffering from any uh, violation of human rights. We are human beings. We like each other. So there is no, no way that any country, any leader, will make the other people suffering by their own policy. So now I will try to respond to the many questions. Altogether, I counted almost 30 questions from the floor. So we will respond one by one. The first, the first question answer will come from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the second will come from Women Federation. The third speaker will come from Ministry of Justice. The fourth will come from Ministry of Foreign Affairs again. The fifth speaker will be from uh, National Assembly. The sixth will come from Ministry of Public Security. And the seventh speaker will come from Ministry of Information. So I just informed you in advance the list of our speaker and our, our, our official will respond one by one to your question. Now I give the floor to the official Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the speaker from Ministry of Foreign Affairs is Mr. Pukong Sisulat, Director General, Department of Treaty and Law of Foreign Affairs. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair, uh, 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 distinguished committee members, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to go straight to the questions that raised by committee members regarding question number one, two, three, and 12. On the question number, number one regarding the, the relationship between uh, ICCPR and the national legislation, or in general, is the relationship between treaty obligations and national uh, law. We have provided in our <coughs> initial report and also in the uh, answer to the list of questions. And I would like to provide further information to the question raised by, by the committee. Uh, <coughs> before I start, I would like to inform the committee that the, one of the new developments in our legislation in the Lao PDR is the adoption of the new law, law on treaties and international agreements, replacing the presidential ordinance <coughs> on treaty making uh, implementation and implementation in the Lao PDR. So now the new law is applicable in place of the own ordinance. And uh, the principle on the relationship between international law and treaties still <coughs> remain the same in the new law as provided for in the <coughs> ordinance, particularly uh, regarding the conflict between treaty obligations and uh, national legislations, treaty obligation prevents, we say. And uh, this is in theory, but the question regarding the practical application of <coughs> this principle in, now, in our national legal uh, setting or context. And uh, I would like to confirm that in the new law, 
we own uh, the law PDR adopts, still adopts dual, dual list legal system, meaning that uh, treaty obligation or treaty will be nationally effective after being transposed into national legislation. This is the main principle. However, the new law also adds some new elements. Some treaties can be directly applicable or part of the treaty can be directly applicable. When it is decided so by the ratifying authority, this means the National Assembly, or by the government when it comes to accepting or approving of the treaty. So there are some cases when the treaty is safe executing, it's clear enough, and we don't have the law yet, and we are not ready to adopt new law, that the National Assembly in ratifying treaty or the government in adopting treaty may decide to apply directly the provision of the treaty. This is a new new element. But still, Lao Pin R still follows the, the dualist legal system still. And uh, uh, the example of cases when there is conflict between international treaties and uh, obligation, for example. And there have been a number of situations when we found that existing uh, legislation is not in compliance or conflict with the, the treaty to be ratified or the existing treaties. In this case, it is the obligation or the duty of the concerned authority, the concerned ministry, to propose to amend the existing law or to adopt new law to implement the treaties. So this is a kind of precautions, precautions approach so that we try very hard at the beginning to ensure that there is no conflict in the, in the future. So at, when, when it comes to lawmaking, the lawmakers, the concerned authorities, we try very hard to ensure that there must not be conflict between treaty obligation and international uh, and, and national legislation. And, uh, but in reality, we still find some gaps we, we have identified some gaps between national legislation and treaty obligation, and we are tr addressing the <coughs> gaps. And, uh, and also in our law on court system, the court applies only national law, and the court is not entitled or has, does not have the mandate to apply international law. And this is the dual legal system. And, uh, However, we have uh, a principle that the judiciary will take into account the treaty obligations of the law PDR in adjudicating cases, meaning that in adjudicating cases, judges will not sign articles of treaty, but will try very, very their utmost to, to, to ensure that judgment is in compliance with treaty obligations. And the question, the follow-up question, how we can train the judges to understand, to know the provisions of ICSPR? And this is very, very natural. And over the past year, we have been very, very, uh, very active in this, particular, particularly Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We, we implemented the so-called uh, committee member may, may be aware of the international law project implemented by Ministry of Foreign Affairs and funded by UNDP, the European Union, and other development partners. The International Law Project organized many training courses, many workshops, many, many lectures, and many, many uh, occasions to train government officials, to train members of the National Assemblies, to train judges, prosecutors, law enforcement officers, so that they understand the international obligation on human rights, particularly of the law PDR, so that they think about the obligation in their discharging of their duties, in their adjudicating of cases. So this is, 
this is our job, and, and we, we've done this for many years. The international law project started in 2000 and, uh, 2001 and ended in 2013. And then we continue to implement the legal and sector master plan uh, program based in Ministry of Justice and also continue to training of different target groups, including judges and uh, prosecutors, law enforcement officers. So this is about how we try to ensure that uh, there, there must not be conflict between international obligation and, and national legislation, but when it comes to action conflict, and we try hard to ensure that judges or law enforcement officers can uh, take into account TT obligations, particularly uh, including the ICCPR. And uh, the next question regarding reservations and, uh, and declarations that we made to uh, Article uh, 22 and Article 1 and uh, 18 of the ICCPR, on the reservation, we, we, we made uh, on Article 22 on freedom of associations because we, in that, at that time, we have had only the degree on, uh, on associations, and, but, but the Constitution provides that the Lao citizens have the freedom to, to form association and not contrary to the law. And the degree 115 then uh, ensures that the exercise of freedom of, uh, of associations uh, is in compliance with, with the Constitution. And uh, that's why we have made reservation, because Article 22 is very short, actually. There are uh, propositions there, provisions, and also there are limitations clause in Article 22. And it's not very clear. I understand that the committee has adopted the general comments related also to Article 22. That's why we, we say that uh, the applications or the exercise of freedom of association in the Lao PDR must be in accordance with the national legislation, the constitution and law, and at the same time with the obligation of the Lao PDR under Article 22 of the ICCPR. So we look at both uh, national legislation and, 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 uh, and national and law. But when it comes to conflict, to conflict between, for example, in Article 22 and the decree on associations, as I have, say, I have mentioned earlier, when it comes to conflict, treaty obligation, Article 22 prevents, meaning Article 22 prevents over the decree of the Lao PDR, but with the principle that uh, it must not be conflict with the Constitution, meaning that we have the approach that the most important is the Constitution, and then we have treaty obligations, and then we have national le legislation. So, and then we try very hard not to, 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 to create a situation when Article 22 when we when we in conflict with the constitution, with, when the exercise of this article, if it conflicts with the constitution, and this will be invalid in the Lao PDR, but it when it conflict with the decree on association, Article 22 prevents. And uh, on reservation to to. Uh, declaration to Article 1, it is very common if committee members recall uh, declaration made by many, many state parties on Article 1 regarding the right to self-determination. I think we just look at the reservation by Article country, on a declaration by Article country, and we just follow up, follow that. <laughs> and, uh, but however, it's very important to note that uh, when we talk about people, in the Lao PDR, we refer to the whole multi-ethnic people of the Lao PDR, which consists of 49 ethnic groups. And we, we have uh, officially organized 49 ethnic groups in, in the Lao PDR. No single group 
can be considered as people the Lao Pitya. So the whole nation, the whole people of the Lao Pitya as a group and enjoy this collective right under the ICCPR. And I think this we, we, we try to make this very clear and to interpret Article 1 in our application. And that's why we, and, uh, and then when it, uh, when in the exercise of the right to safe determination, this does not affect the national independence, political unity, political independence, and territorial integrity of, of, of the country. This is the purpose of, of making a declaration to Article 1 of the ICCPR. And uh, regarding Article 18, and it is very similar to Article 20, 22, but declaration is not the same as reservation. Declaration does not aim to, uh, to modify the, the effect of Article 18, just to interpret that right to freedom of religion, for example, must be interpreted in accordance with our context. And this does not mean that we limit the right to freedom of, uh, of religion. This is we try to, to create legitimate limitation to the practice, to the exercise of, of the right to freedom of religion in practice. And uh, because in the, in the past, there were some groups try to misuse freedom of, uh, of religion to induce people, for example, to, to de divide solidarity among people, among any groups, for example. That's why we think, why exercising this freedom, there should not be any attempt to use any means, including economic means, for example, give money or anything to, to the people, so that they convert or they, they cancel the, the religion or belief that they have had already, and uh, for, for some reason, for some benefits. That's why we think uh, we, we try to push legitimate limitations on the practice of freedom of religion by, by making declaration under Article, Article, 20, Article 18. And uh, my uh, another point regarding the NHRIs, the Paris Principle based NHRIs, we understand that uh, the questions raised by the committee member regarding the NHRI and, uh, and whether they are effective enough and whether allows really to, 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 to create national human rights commissions based on the Paris principles. As we provided in our national report and also in the, in the, uh, the answer to, to the list of questions, Laos is not, is now is trying very hard to strengthen the existing mechanism, which consists of the National Steering Committee on Human Rights, the National Commission for the Advancement of Women and Children, and the National Commissions for the Person with Disabilities and Identity, and also the National Committee on Anti-Human Trafficking. So we try to implement or to strengthen the existing mechanism, but not to already go to other options because we, once we want to, because when it comes to uh, uh, NHRI based Paris principles, for example, the question raised whether the existing mechanism covers all events of, of human rights, for example. As I, said, I have mentioned earlier, there, there is National Commission for the Advancement of Women and Mother and Child Affairs, National Commission for the Person with Disabilities, and the elderly, and importantly, the National Steering Committee on Human Rights. The chair is sitting here, the Minister to Prime Minister of Peace, His Excellency Woodgood Sang Som Sak, chairing the National Steering Committee on Human Rights. And this committee cover all aspects of human rights, not only particular issues of human rights, all civil and political rights. That's why we are here today. And uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, UPR, uh, tortures, ICERT, and also 
but not CDO and CRC and CRPD, which are responsible of other commission. So uh, this committee incorporate a number of Paris principles mandate as well. For example, the study of, of treaties, the ensure implementation at the national level, for example. So, and uh, however, we are also have been, we, we, we have been also studying the lessons and experience of other country which have national human rights institutions based on the Paris Principle. For example, we work very closely with the Australian Commission on Human Rights, and uh, we even have here workshops on uh, national, regional, and international mechanism on human rights. We invited members of the commission from a number of countries, from India, from Indonesia, from Australia, from others, to share their perspectives, how their commissions work, so that we can learn from them to strengthen the commissions that we have. And uh, this commission is government body, is intergovernmental agency. Arrangements is not independent as such, but however, in its work, we are a kind of independent in looking at issues, in looking at the matters that come before us, for example. So in the committee, in the National Student Committee, for example, there are members from different agencies, from the courts, from National Assembly, from academic institutions. They, when there is issue, they will take the issue up to their institution. For example, if we have, uh, we have a matter relating to the court, the member from the court will take care of that issues and uh, continue and follow up to that. And uh, my uh, another thing about the the uh, ratification of the optional protocol, as mentioned by 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 the member mem uh, committee members, regarding the optional protocol on uh, individual communications. I understand that uh, the first uh, op optional protocol, and we. At, the, it, at this moment, we are not ready. Why? Because we don't have, we want, don't want to have big burden, reporting, reporting, and very hard for us, for example, to compile reports under ICCPI. It took us almost 10 years. And we don't want to have that uh, over, overdue reports again, for example. That's why uh, we want to, really want to, uh, to, uh, enhance national mechanism on complaints. There is now justice committee in the National Assembly. There's now national committee also can, can receive some, some information on human rights, for example. And, uh, and as committee members are very well aware, before we can allow our citizen to file their complaints with the committee under the optional protocol, there must be exorcisms of domestic remedies. And we don't have yet. We want to strengthen domestic remedies before we can go to international. That's why this is one of the reasons that we, we, try to, we are not ready to ratify the optional protocol. And uh, my last point regarding uh, the issues of enforced disappearance. And uh, the Lao PDR was the first country among many one of the first country to sign the Convention on Protection of Own Person from Enforced Disappearance. And uh, in 2008, in Asia, there were only four countries by that, by that time. Laos is, was one of them. And after that, we, 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 we studied the Convention very, very thoroughly and trying to understand the wording. And, but Convention is very complex and very unique. There is maybe two in one, I would say about communication, about visit, and about everything. So we need to raise awareness. We need to uh, raise capacity of official concern before we can ratify this, these conventions. And uh, I, I think the last question I would like to address regarding the enforced disappearance that was mentioned by my committee member. And uh, on the issues of... Uh, in for this period, uh, in the Lao national legal system, 
we don't have yet the definitions on enforced disappearance as such in the conventions. Why? Because we are not yet party to the convention. And there is no legal obligation for the country to incorporate the definitions of enforced disappearance under the convention. The country just sign. If we ratify, yet we try to, to, to incorporate the division, division of enforced disappearance. And however, uh, on investigation of enforced disappearance, there's mentioned by, by committee members on uh, Somba Somphorn and uh, I think on some, some other cases, I think because of the time limit, I would like to address only some, only the issues of, uh, only issue of uh, Somba Somphorn. Uh, on uh, the issue of summa uh, we uh, we really think that the committee members understand very well the actual situations or the actual happening of of the incident, and uh, after the incident happened, the government established committee. And the government, uh, the committee, uh, try very hard at first. On the first day, for example, they already sent notice to own headquarters of the police around the country, and they also contacted international organizations. And so they, they are, they were trying very hard. Really, now they, they have been trying very hard into, in uh, the investigations. But still, I think it is very natural. One person disappear or missing. It's very, very hard. In many countries, disappearance case happen, and years can be, uh, uh, the case can be, can be set, and you know, can be decided. And, uh, and the issues of, uh, we, the Lao Pita also accepted a number of UPR recommendations on, uh, on investigations, but the police authority uh, have their capacity the police authority have their techniques to investigate. That's why we think that there is no need for 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 us to 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 have uh, international assistance because the police have tried very hard already. But one person disappear is very hard to find the person or something. And I will stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, my colleagues. He took more than 20 minutes for him alone. I don't know if we can follow the, the, the schedule uh, proposed by our chairperson. But anyway, before giving the floor to the next speaker, I would like to add some, some point on my colleague's comments just to clarify some other things. Three points here. First, on the reservation and declaration, Article 118 and 22, I can assure you that the law government is in the process of reconsidering, reviewing this uh, statement in, in, in reservation. If need be, I think by two years from now, we may be able to come out with something new, something that's suitable to the concern of the, of the members of the committee expressed today. Uh, second point uh, on the National Steering Committee on Human Rights. I think the importance that I was attached to the point is that this commission is chaired by minister. That's to show you the importance the law government attached to this human rights issue. If you look around the country in Europe or in Asia, very few countries a commission chaired by the minister, the cabinet of the government. But in Laos, we can do it because the issue is so important in terms in term of, of interest uh, for our a country, as I told you in my statement, that after 500 years without uh, the, uh, the privilege to enjoy our basic right, now it's time for us to let our people to enjoy the full right that we should have the, the, the right to enjoy. It's my second point. My third point is going to be long, Mr. Chairman, I, because Professor Grant asked me, asked the, asked the uh, my delegation about Sumbat Sumpon. Uh, if you permit, Mr. Chairman, I will go back to the history. Uh, but first, I'm surprised 
the professor can get more information that I get as a country. So I think I need more time to discuss with uh, Professor Grant outside the meeting room so I can collect her uh, with her the, the most important information about Sumbat Sumpon. Sumbat Sumpon is a best friend of mine. I was actually a fair in Washington for nine years. In Sumbat Sumpon, I was a student at Hawaii University. I invited him to come to my embassy two or three times a year to celebrate the Lao New Year or whatever the Lao, uh, the Lao National Day. And I encouraged him to return to Laos after completing his study. In fact, he, he did it. He went back to, to Laos after he completing his university study. In Vientiane, after his return to Vientiane, he joined the Ministry of Education as one of the uh, expert uh, personality in terms of the rural economic development. During that time, I was in Washington, and I met him very often. We changed, we discussed. But then he left Ministry of Education to form his own INGO. Since then, he changed his personality. He stay away from me. He didn't want to talk to me. Even in a meeting, in a reception, he tried to avoid me. I don't know why. Maybe somebody know why. But for me, it was a surprise that my good friend, my best friend, changed the, 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 the habit uh, to talk together every often than to turn back to me and stay away from me. That's the story. I can assure you, after his disappearance, my son personally, I am involved in the process of investigation to make sure that the process is going correctly according to the law of my country. But now, the last point of Sumbat case. There was a question asked, why the Lao government did not declare that Sumbat Sumpon is a disappearing person? The court cannot do it. The court hold the case <coughs> because there are very unclear information what will happen if the government declare that Sumbat Sumpon is a disappearing person. Two consequences will emerge. First, who will be able to succeed is his asset, because there are two claims from Laos and from other country. The so-called wife, his wife, also claimed to, to own the asset. And one of his family also claimed to own the asset. The court doesn't know who legally owned the asset. And to my surprise, just a few days ago, before leaving Vientian to, to, to Geneva, I just learned that his asset is a tremendous sum of money. Sumbat was with me in Washington as a student. He returned to Laos as a person working for the NGO without salary. He worked as, how do you call that, a charité, a charité, action for the people in the rural area. Just a few days ago, I was informed that his asset, more than, we, more than us here, I, may, I think it may be more than our members of the, the committees here. If I can reveal this, I don't know, is interested by the, by the committee or not? If, I, if you want me, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Person, I can reveal to you the exact exit that we know for the time being. He owned almost half a million US dollars in the two banks in Laos. He owned 15 portion of land. If you sell it, it's going to be a million, million dollars. He owned three, four, four villa, not house, I repeat, a villa in Vientiane. So if you put all together here, all the things like car, 
how many million dollar Sumbat own? So the question asks, where does money come? He worked for charity for more than 10 years. I think somebody can ask to give me the answer. How he can get this money, almost one or two million dollar, from a person who worked for charity and can accumulate such sum of money? So that's why we cannot, the court cannot make a decision as to who to give the money. First, his wife, his so-called wife, she has no paper, I mean, no legal paper confirming the legal marriage between Sumbat and herself. So if we give asset to her just without any proof, any evidence, then when we come back to the consequences, the government will be affected by his, by his decision. Second claim, the so-called his sister. His sister claimed to own all this asset, almost two, three million dollars, because she said Sumbat is her, her brother, <coughs> staying in her house before going to the U.S., spend money in the U.S. from the family house. So she has the right to claim the asset belong to Sumbat should belong to the family. So we don't know who is who has the right to succeed his asset. That's right now we try to prove by legal evidence who is she as why. We ask her to provide us a legal evidence to prove they get a marriage, a legal marriage, legitimate marriage between Sumbat and his wife. And we ask his sister to prove that there are sister and Sumbat live in her house before going to the U.S. for almost eight years, ten years there. But so far, no strong evidence come to the court, and the court cannot make a decision on this. So we are here right now on, on this point. So if anybody get more information on this, please give us, then we will accelerate the process up of uh, a court decision. Now I give to the next speaker uh, from my list here. It's going to be Minister, no, a woman federation who will respond to few of the questions posed by our members of the committee. Uh, where is the? Yes. You had the floor, sir. You had the floor. Oh, yes. I think the first speaker will be uh, Madame Kampau. Uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, who will give us the, the, the first answer to the question posed by the floor. Madam Pao, you have the floor. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Minister. Minister. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson, uh, committee members uh, attending the meeting. I'm very pleased to be here together with you to be a uh, delegation of uh, ICTPR for uh, the meeting to answer the question. But this uh, question, uh, actually, I also would like to thank the members of uh, uh, committees to raise the question on the gender issues in the law PDR. But uh, the detail of the information uh, regarding to the question, I will let it uh, give it to at uh, the authority concerns that is La Women Union to answer the detail. But for me, I would like to provide uh, the committee some information of the women, the role of the La Women in the political, public, in the public and political life in the La PDR. Uh, I can give you some example, uh, the number of the women in the uh, public and uh, uh, public and political life in the La PDR. As the, I mentioned, right, in, the, in this year 2015, that, uh, they are, uh, there were 62 ministers and equivalent. Among them, they, they are 19.6% is a women. Right? And also the, the, uh, the rank of deputy minister and equivalent, uh, they are 121 uh, deputy minister and equivalent. So among them, they are 16.2 percent. And uh, oh, sorry, uh, it's a 12.3 uh, percent among them. And also, uh, the total of the director general 
in the different underlying ministry in the Lao PDR, uh, there are 437 among them. They are 16.2 percent are women. Right. And also, uh, Deputy Director General, uh, the number is uh, 946 women. Among them, they are 19.6 percent is the women. And, uh, and also we have uh, another 50 deputy provincial governors, and among them 5 percent. I also see the same as you, that they have a less number, a small number for the uh, provincial governors, right? And also uh, for the district chief position, that we have only 6 percent among uh, 448 uh, number of that. So, so uh, the, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2015, the uh, total of the uh, public servant altogether is uh, 177,626 uh, uh, persons. So among them, there are uh, 79,662 uh, women that we can say that we have a quite big number at the time, that we have 44.8% altogether. So now, you know, the, the women are proportionately represented in the justice system. I would like to clarify with you that the female officers comprise 38% of uh, 641 officers in the Ministry of Justice. And also female officers in district justice divisions accounts for 26.9%. And uh, at the same time, they have 27% at the district level and 39% at the provincial level. The Office of the Supreme People Prosecutor has a total of 1,617 officers uh, of whom that they have. 33.7% uh, are female. Yeah, so we can say that we, quite, uh, we have a lot of uh, women in that uh, public and uh, political rights. So nowadays, uh, I would like to uh, clarify on the role of women in the National Assembly. Uh, the sorry, National sorry Assembly. Minister, I think you had to shorten your speed. We are running out of time. I have 20 minutes left. There are seven speakers on my list. Okay. So I think it's uh, maybe you have already had it in the, the reporting, right? It of the, the, the reporting and uh, for the committee of ICPC already. So the another so I, I can pass it to the authority concern to clarify another question that raised by the member of committees. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Yes, now give the floor to Women Federation. Mr. Chairperson, member of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of La Women Union, um, due to the limited limitation of time, please allow me to give you some more information um, to cover as much as questions raised by the member of the committee. First of all, I would like to uh, start with the, uh, the issue of the sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, as we um, already know that um, um, the we, we already clearly stipulated in the Article 35th and 37th of the Constitution that uh, all our citizens are equal before the law. And the government also attached the importance to promote and protect the human rights of la all our citizens without discrimination, including the people with uh, different sexual orientation and gender identity. So um, we, we, we treat everyone equally before the law. So. Um, Regarding the status of the law on gender equality, it is now in the process of uh, drafting um, by the drafting committee, who is now working around the clock, including the, the weekend that I was leaving from Laos to Geneva. They are working on the draft. Uh, as we plan to bring the draft to seek for comments from various stakeholders and the public uh, before seeking for the approval from National Assembly by the end of this year. So let I move to the um, issue about um, the labor law. Um, in Article 45 of the labor law, uh, stipulates that employee who perform e 
equal quantity, quality, and value of work are entitled, entitled to receive equal salary, wages, and other benefits without any discrimination as to race, nationality, gender, age, etc. So in the Article 15, Paragraph 2 of the Law on Development and Protection of Women, also stipulates that women um, hold the same position, tax, work, and responsibility as men shall have the right to remuneration and benefits on an equal basis of the man. Uh, in addition, uh, maternity leave allows is an increase from three months now for uh, from three months to five months um, in the case of just uh, like normal delivery, but uh, it will up to six months for the C-section. So this is also um, contribute to the um, equality um, before the labor law. Let's I also move to the points that um, mentioned by the member of the committee about uh, we are having the gender equality um, national strategy. We have a gender advancement. We have national action plan on violence against women and violence against children. So as you um, mentioned about the result of the study from the university in 2015, we um, understand that um, we are uh, from like um, 49 ethnic groups and we are a modernist country. So uh, we try to do our best to give them uh, as much as information. And um, along with the National Commission Committee on the Advancement of Women, we have the Love Women Union, which have the uh, organization structure from the central to grassroots level. So we work hand in hand with each other to, uh, uh, dis to uh, distribute information about the law, about the, the, the rights that they have. And we, we try to organize different kind of uh, public campaign during the International Women Day, 16 day campaigns to end violence against women in November, you all know that. So we, we organize different um, public com campaign to distribute uh, information about the gender equality, women advancement and violence against women. And uh, we also have um, uh, different uh, campaign to to uh, stop violence against women by uh, working hand in hand with men and boys, so they can come up to speak about violence against women uh, within the f family, the so society as well. Uh, for the issue of violence against women and trafficking, um, Love Women Union, we have the counseling center in the capital city, and we have 17 provinces. Now the network of a counseling center, we have uh, 14 <coughs> provinces. And in some provinces we have um, at the district level and village level as well. So for the um, service of counseling and protection center for women and children, we work with the victims or survivor of the domestic violence and trafficking. So we uh, provide different uh, program to rehabilitate them and integrate them to the society. Um, for the next issue that um, you asked about the situation of elderly and disability, a person with disability, I would like to share with you about the um, decree on person with disabilities, which specify the equal rights for women and children. So in Article 13, uh, stipulates that uh, women with disability shall have equal rights and value to all members of the society in the self-development opportunities to be active in political, economic, so socio-cultural, family, and other affairs in accordance, accordance with the legal regulations. Uh, children with disabilities shall have the right to express their opinion concerning to their rights, interests, or on the equal basis of non-disabled children. The opinion of disabled children shall be treated as uh, specified in the relevant legal regulations. So let I move to the um, issue of uh, elderly. Um, I would like to uh, inform you that in Laopedia, there is no home care um, for elderly because according to, the, uh, to our traditionals, the young persons normally take care of the, and pay respects and support health care of the elderly person in the family including parents, grandparents, and elderly person in the family. 
So um, according to Lao culture, when parents, aunts, uncle, or get older, they will stay with their sons, daughters, and relatives in the family for the, the rest of their life. So we don't have the uh, home care for elderly. Um, let I move to the next um, issue about uh, um, abortion. Yes, please attend your statement. We have yeah. more seven speakers <laughs> on the list. Um, we have two kinds of abortion that you know. Um, we have a legal abortion for the person who are uh, like treating their life, so they can have legal abortion. For the illegal one, we, we know about the uh, importance of that, so we have different kind of program to, to educate uh, young people, girls and women in the society to know about how to protect themselves from uh, such kind of harmful. So um, due to the time limitation, I will um, end my contribution now. Thank you. Thank you. I think my colleague forgot to respond to the question pro by Professor Santos Pei on how much Laos can increase the number of women in the public function and how much Laos can protect women from violence. I will not respond, but I will tell you a story of what happened to me in the National Assembly three years ago. Three years ago, I was Minister of Justice and I submit draft law on violence against a woman. I presented the, law, the draft to the floor. After that comment from the floor, one MP raised his hand and I gave him the floor. His question asked me, Bunker, are you a man or woman? I told him, of course I'm a man. And he said, how a man, if you are a man, how a man like you submit a law against a man. Because the article I submit is very important. This article said that if husband fork his wife to have sex relationship without her consent, considered as a rape, he will go to jail for 14 months. <coughs> he said, if you are a man, you are against man. We consider you as a woman, not man anymore. And then he submit a counter proposal. On article, he said that after, after going out from the jail, I should have the right to decide whether I can, I can go back to the family or I ask divorce. I should have that right. Without that right, I cannot accept your article. And finally, we have to, to manage to, to get consensus on this. So the next speaker will be from Ministry of Justice. He has four questions to answer. So I don't read, you have the floor. Head of Delegation, Station and Distinguished uh, Member Committees, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, due to the limited time, I try to cover on the comments, oh, sorry, on the, on the questions raised by the committees. And I also would like to uh, ally with uh, the Head of Delegation to thank you and welcome these uh, questions. To start with, I would like to go with uh, the, the question by uh, Madame or the wall uh, about the non-discriminations. Uh, thank you very much for your analysis. And is it true that uh, the non-discrimination is concept uh, recognized in our constitution? And several of uh, these are also inter interpreted and incorporated in several laws. However, uh, from your analysis, you found that uh, different uh, concept of the non-discrimination in different laws. And I would like to say that, is it true as well, some of the concept uh, is missing from the particular laws? Is it due to, for two reasons? One is, uh, uh, depends on substantive matters of the law. So we're trying to narrow the understanding of that, uh, that people can easily understand the scope of the law. And secondly, we understand that. Uh, the basic standard, uh, the, the core principle of the non-discrimination is already provided, stated in our constitution. Still, is it applied anyway? Uh, however, you have pointed out some interesting point uh, that we need to consider whether or not Laupedia need to uh, adopt uh, the comprehensive anti-discrimination law. That's a quite uh, interesting one. Uh, 
we, we debated about this, uh, but the solution several years ago, but solution like that. We have uh, the pr basic principle in the, st uh, in the Constitution, but we also have uh, uh, described uh, some act against uh, non-discrimination uh, non in our penal code already. So uh, whether or not it is still applicable um, to the Lao PDR, that is still, uh, still debating. So, to be honest, I can't give you the timeline and also the answer whether or not we Lao PDR need to adopt the comprehensive uh, the law on the anti-discrimination. Uh, I also would like to uh, uh, put uh, giving some more information regarding to the work of uh, the men and the women. Uh, adding uh, what my colleagues uh, just uh, mentioned. Last year, 2017, uh, Ministry of uh, Labor and Welfare adopted the standard week and salary uh, to be applied uh, for all workers and all laborers in Ilao PDRs. This is uh, applied equally for uh, both uh, men and women. So. I, I believe that there is no gap uh, between men and women regarding to the salary and work. Uh, now I would like uh, to move to, uh, let's see, There's, I got a very long note. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Uh, no, uh, okay, I would like to, to, to go to the, yes, uh, no, I would like to go to the, um, the most difficult one, and, and, and that I would like to clarify. I think uh, Professor Baines uh, mentioned about the uh, uh, caste study. I, to clarify the point, I would like to st uh, start with, I believe uh, everybody knows that the uh, legal system in different countries have different system. So one maybe can, you can find similarity and maybe different one from another. Uh, for our uh, legal uh, system, cr criminal justice system, prosec public prosecutor is authorized by the law on the criminal procedure to have the power uh, to issue the arrest warrants and also the other uh, authority or warrants uh, for the custody, the suspect or in charge person. And unlike other countries, I, I under, we also learned that where the criminal courts have power to do so. So it allows uh, the public prosecutor has authority to do it. Secondly, under the law, the, there are three states of the investigation that the, 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 what we call now investigation that taken by the police uh, and the prosecution, of course, uh, taken by the prosecutor. And the last stage is a trial and the adjudication, of course, is it by the court, by the, by the judges. Now I would like to go back to the first stage uh, where the is uh, conducted by the police. In case of emergency, police can arrest the suspect uh, that and can pl uh, place him in in custody within 24 hours. But the police must report it to the prosecutor and apply for the arrest warrant immediately after uh, arrested. Uh, the police also have to or must apply, uh, must inform the family or relatives of where such person resided. And within uh, 24 hours, the police must make the decision whether or not to uh, open the, an investigation against such person. And if the police uh, believe so, uh, he can apply and then can ask the permission from uh, the prosecutor. That is a very a brief uh, clarification uh, about your question, and please let me know if uh, I really answer your question. Uh, now I would like to talk about the death penalty. Uh, the question is about uh, the statistic, what we have done so far for the, uh, the reduction of the uh, death penalty to the light imprisonment or uh, the pardons uh, granted by the president and so on. I, I have uh, the statistic very extensive in my hand, and now is it allowed, Mr. Chairperson? If you allow me, uh, let I do it and submit it to the committees by tomorrow. Is it allowed? Yes. yes. Spend the night to, to yes. translate yes. from now to English. Night for yes. that. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, thank you. Finished already? Not yet. Uh, I think so. If there is anything, 
please ask more. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Next speaker, again, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, on two questions. Who can respond that from Foreign Affairs? Yes, Mr. Kenya, you have the floor. Eight minutes. No more eight minutes. Yes, this one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, persons, and this is a member of the committee. With the permission of the meeting, I would like to take my limited time to respond to the two issues that has been raised by Mr. Santos Pace. Uh, on the first issues on the cultural tourism, um, the La Pidia has not adopted the specific law on cultural tourism. However, the cultural tourism activity has been implemented to, through the law on money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism, as stipulated in the Article 7 of this uh, uh, mentioned law. Uh, and it does provide the, the definition of terrorists in the, on, on, the, on the state law as well as in the, on the law on the, on the panel, panel laws as well. Um, I would now like to touch upon, uh, respond briefly on the anti-trafficking in persons. Uh, as we all know that uh, trafficking in person is a heinous crime against human beings. It is complicated. It is usually involves many actors. It's often cross-border and transnational. In this respect, uh, the Lao government spare no effort in countering human trafficking or trafficking in person in the country by adopting a number of policy legislation and measures, such as the law on anti-trafficking in person, uh, the law on anti-human trafficking in 2015, the second national plan of action on anti-trafficking in, in uh, human trafficking for 2017 to 2020, which consists of five programs, 23 projects, and 138 activity with, the, uh, with a set of annual budget uh, to facilitate or implement the state plan. However, uh, budget constraint and lack of human resource, as well as the capacity and expertise, is of the challenge for the countries, uh, for the government as well. Um, may I share with you that this uh, February this year, the National Steering Committee on Anti-Trafficking in Person uh, released uh, its uh, national annual report on anti-trafficking in persons in the LAO PDR for 2017, highlighted the policy activities as well as bilateral cooperation uh, with our neighboring countries, namely China, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, as well as uh, highlighting the cooperation with uh, uh, multilateral uh, cooperation uh, with ASEAN, with development partners, as well as international organizations, as well as the UN's uh, specialist agencies in the countries. Uh, I don't have a specific number to share with the meeting today, but uh, uh, we do have the, the copy of the annual report. If it's a wish to, to obtain it, uh, you can approach me and I can share with the, uh, with the member of the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Kanya is the last speaker for our session this afternoon. Before giving back the floor to the chairperson, I would like to just make a brief comment on, on my chairmanship this afternoon. First, I am very much thankful to all the members of the committee for the question, for the comments posed to my delegation. And I found that a very constructive, very productive dialogue, uh, the first round. And I hope tomorrow is going to be more productive, more fruitful uh, on our dialogue between the two, the two sides. Second, I am sure and I feel that my colleague did not respond all the question posed by the members of the committee, if I may propose, Chairperson, would it be possible that tomorrow, after submitting oral proposal, it might be gratitude, uh, gratitude to us to collect the written, the written uh, answer or question, uh, a written question from the members of the committee, so we can read in full detail, and we can respond in the full detail on the question posed by distinguished member of the committee. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll give you back the floor. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Head of Delegation. Uh, and I really want to thank you and the rest of the delegation for making a tremendous effort to respond in a short period of time to uh, the torrent of uh, questions that we have uh, put to you. Uh, you. You did a great job. Indeed, there are some issues that have not been fully answered. Uh, and we will, uh, we will uh, allocate uh, a few minutes in the beginning of the session tomorrow for the delegation to reflect. You, ha you have, uh, you have uh, listed 30 points that you wanted to discuss, so you will have the opportunity tonight to review these points. And, of course, uh, I also encourage uh, colleagues, uh, my colleagues on the committee, if they feel that there has not been an adequate response to their question, Please bring it to the attention of the of the delegation. Of course, the the whole uh, event is being filmed. Uh, you will have it, so you will have the opportunity to see everything uh, in due course. Uh, um, uh, if there are any specific clarifications that you need uh, from members, you can approach the secretariat, and we'll try to facilitate it. Um, in, now we do have uh, five minutes in which I do encourage members uh, of the committee to pose. Uh, follow-up questions, uh, which could either deal with issues that were addressed by the, by the delegation or draw the attention of the delegation to matters that the committee would wish further information on uh, tomorrow at the beginning of the session. The delegation, of course, will not respond now to those questions. Uh, they will take note of the issues, and we will start tomorrow with 15 to 20 minutes by which the delegation will be able to complete its first round of questions to address some of the follow-up questions, and then we will proceed. Uh, I give the floor now to Madam Cran, who will be asking some follow-up questions. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Given the time constraint, uh, I'll simply flag some of the questions that weren't answered and ask for those responses tomorrow. Um, if you could give us an update on the status of the following cases of disappearances. Um, you, you dealt with the one case of, of disappearance, but there were many others that I asked about. So the forcibly um, repatriated from Thailand, Hmong, in 2011. Also, Ka Yang, the Leo ethnic Hmong who was arrested after his forcible return. What is the update on that case? The Hmong men who surrendered themselves and then were detained or subject to enforced disappearances. Fourth, the exiled Thai activist who was abducted by armed men in 2017. The th student leaders arrested in October 1999 for organizing a peaceful pro-democracy protest the two women and seven men detained by security forces back in 2009, and the critic of the Chinese-sponsored agricultural projects reportedly disappeared um, after uniformed armed men abducted him. So if we could have a detailed update on those cases tomorrow. And then a few other points. Um, would the government consider opening up the membership of the National Steering Committee on Human Rights that's chaired by the head of the delegation to civil society organizations at this time. So there would be civil society members on the uh, committee or commission as there are in other countries. You, you've mentioned the first optional protocol and some administrative reasons. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if these, these administrative reasons are in the process of being reconsidered given the benefits that ratifying the optional protocol would bring uh, to people in Laos. And um, it's not clear to me from what's been said today why Laos doesn't withdraw the reservation to Article 22 if the Constitution and the decree provide for freedom of association in line with the the article. So uh, the head of the delegation has encouragingly mentioned that they, you may reconsider. Perhaps you could say more about that, timelines and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
uh, and I thank the delegation for the replies up to now. I haven't heard the uh, uh, responses to issue number five about hate speech, maybe tomorrow. I also haven't heard anything on the discrimination on uh, minorities or indigenous people and uh, the confirmation of the abolishing of the mandatory death penalty. That penalty, and of course, also the numbers and uh, the cases on which a death penalty have been. Uh, and yes, that, those were the, the the question. Thank you. Yes, we will have more time tomorrow for other members also to uh, jump in. But M Mr. Santos Spice uh, requested the floor. We are now uh, really at the end of the meeting, so please be brief, sir. I will, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, just two brief points. Uh, first, one of the admirable things of discussing human rights is that we can speak on behalf of women and women can speak on behalf of men. So <laughs> this is one of the reasons why I addressed the question gender equality. Uh, one of the issues that I think was not brought during the discussion was the problem of torture, uh, the prohibition of torture. I think it's very important and it links with the questions that we'll be addressing tomorrow, namely uh, the situation in correctional institutions and penitentiaries. So I would invite the delegation to reflect on this and tomorrow to think about both and discuss both at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So on this note, we will uh, conclude the meeting for today. We will start tomorrow with the delegation, so you are able to respond, sir, to, to many of these issues. Uh, I do wish us all uh, a very good evening. Uh, um, we, uh, as, as, the, as the proverb that was uh, quoted by uh, the head of delegation, uh, Mr. Sangsom Smack, was that uh, we, uh, today we eat full. Yes. We dress warm. Tomorrow we will eat deliciously, right? Yes. And dress beautifully. So hopefully this will uh, reflect our dialogue for tomorrow. Yes. So good evening. Thank you.